All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode. And my guest joining me today, he is the original. Norman, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing good, Mr. Mike. How's it going? How's everybody that's watching involved? Hello. I'm here. <laughs> it, feels like a, it feels like a long time no see, right? Right, yeah. It was, it was really good to actually meet you in person, which was really nice. Uh, Mr. John Brennan, I want to thank him for putting that together and you got to meet Glenn also. Felt oh, like yes. a little bit of a real world reunion. <laughs> I know you almost, you almost got to meet the best too. She was in orbit that day. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. For those that don't know, I posted that uh, picture and everybody of me and John Brennan, everybody saw, and um, everybody was like, Oh, this is a great picture. The quality of the phone, uh, what camera are you using? Well, for those that don't know, the person actually taking that photo was Norm on his phone. So he's got the nice little fancy uh, camera quality. What phone, by the way, was that? That is the um, Pro Max, the IMAX 13. Um, and it, it takes great pictures. I, actually, um, over the weekend, I was with a friend of mine and she's written some horror films and some lifetime projects and stuff. And so we were kind of bored and we ended up using the phone and making like this little sh horror film, the wood, Witch short. So do you still get like those like jitters when you come to New York? Because I know like New York's like a place that if you don't live there all the time, you get like a, wow, this is so great type of thing. But for you, you know, your real world season was there. So you're pretty acclimated to New York. Do you still get kind of the thrill when you get there or, or those like thrill, the beginner thrill has gone away rather. Oh, you know, New York is always a thrill, but for me, I feel more like Rip Van Winkle because I just can't, I mean, I stayed in Astoria, Queens the last time I was there. It doesn't even, it's like Dallas, like literally flat in the city and right off of like that WN train is an entirely new glass. There's got to be at least 50 different buildings that are all like super high rise. I mean, it's, it's super nuts. And like, then I had to go over to Brooklyn where my art, show is up currently by the Barclays. Like none of that stuff was there. Like Flatbush Avenue is unrecognizable to me. So I don't even feel like I'm in the same city at all. And um so it's I feel like such a big tourist, which is kind of funny. You know, I feel like one of my parents would drop me off at college and <laughs> and they'd be wandering around looking at all the buildings and oh let's do this site. Let's go here and there and all that stuff. And now I'm I'm one of those people and um <laughs> yeah i remember when we were going to the uh the library that's like a pretty touristy spot was that like mm. your first time going to there you know my actually my college um i went to cooper union in the lower east side and um and when we had our graduation they had a dinner um for the graduation and so a, a party or some kind of dance so they went when, when I was in New York um, and doing a little bit of my own touristy stuff, I was highly anticipating seeing your guys loft for the first time in person. And when I got there, I saw it and I was like, this is like a pretty basic loft. Like if this wasn't if this didn't host like a real world season, like you would just like, you know, brush it off your shoulders, just another place. You know what I mean? And I guess that like speaks volumes to like the true guinea pig experiment that you guys were because like nobody knew what they were signing up for at the time. Whereas like you guys laid the foundation for future seasons to be pretty much put into like all these like luxury houses and like mansions and stuff. Yeah. So did you actually get to go inside the loft or you just looked at the outside? I looked at the outside. Cause yeah, I know they have a lot of construction going on and, um, of course, you know, New York can kind of brag for some of the most expensive real estate in the world. So, you know, even to get something like that, it's, um, you know, pretty. It, 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 back in the day, that was pretty luxurious, uh, you must say, for a bunch of kids that had just got out of college to see something like that. But, yes, um, they certainly went through the upgrades um on the locations and of course the trips also got upgraded if you remember you know only the girls got to go to jamaica the guys they couldn't even afford it so um you know but by the time they got to la and everybody else they were on their way you know i think what some of them went off to africa and they were on hot air balloons running around and all kinds of stuff <laughs> 
Well, could you talk to me a little bit about uh, what you're up to today? I know I saw from, you know, following you on Instagram, you're doing some stuff uh, you've done for Mattel, uh, Nickelodeon, just to name a few. What exactly are you up to today? Uh, well, currently right now, if you're actually watching this and you're in the metropolitan area of New York, um, I have uh, several art pieces up um, uh, that are at um, a gallery there on Franklin Street. Um, it's my gallery, brooklyn.com. And um, I do a lot of artwork, so that's was pretty good. Um, on top of that, I somehow got into a film. I've I don't know, Norm, they want me. So I, 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 I'm not an actor, so I don't know how I got caught up. But I'm in a film called an, um, uh, T Take a Stand for Damaged Fame. And it was a bunch of different types of reality people um, that were on different reality shows. And so they all kind of come into this Tony Robertson or this health group, this self-help group. And so we're there for this counseling. And it's all fiction. And uh, it's a comedy, and so I'm in it, and somehow um, I've been getting some weird awards, like Best Actor in this film. And um, so that film is out. I'm going to be going down to Lafayette, Louisiana. It's going to be there, but it's been, like, all over the world. It's been, like, in Sicily, and it's been in Germany and Spain, and it's been all, all over Texas. It's been all, everywhere in short comedy film festivals. So now it's down to this Iberia film festival coming up in Lafayette. So the director just called me and said, hey, ah, come on down. We're going to fly you down there. So that's been kind of a funky little fun ride. Um, on top of that, I still have my design company, Adaptive Origins. We're just starting to get back up into production. Uh, right now, this whole gear is set up on an A stand, which is like a computer stand. So you can kind of raise your computer up and you can use it as a portable workstation. So I've developed this, have a couple patents on it, and I've been able to... Um, do some Kickstarter and some Indiegogo and all this kind of stuff um, and raise some money and go back and forth to China. And so I've got an order coming up with Japan. Uh, I'm so, so sorry. My computers are ding, ding, ding. This is my life. This is Norm. And on, on top of that, I'm getting lots of requests for podcasts and just insanity. So my devices are always ringing around the clock saying, hey, Norm, where are you at? Come do something. Um, yeah, since the COVID, a lot of stuff kind of shut down. I worked on an independent film um, as an art director. And those um, companies that you mentioned, I did art direction for their commercials and um, their films and such. So um, uh, so that's kind of... Oh, also, I work at my cousin's bakery here. If you've oh, got wow. a chance to see the, um, the homecoming, um, I, my family bakery here. So I do go in and I enjoy working at the bakery. Um, and so that's been a good good thing also. So I make pasties, which in the UP is a little meat pie, folks. It's like with potatoes and meat and onions, and you wrap it up in this kind of crust and you bake it, and it's a little, it's a little pie. It looks like a calzone if you're in New York, yeah. but it's a, called a pasty, not a pasty. A lot of people think that they're pasties when they come here and they kind of giggle and laugh. They're pasties, and they're found here in the northern part of Michigan in the Upper Peninsula. <laughs> so a little bit of a jack of all trades type of thing then going on for you. Yeah. <laughs> Would you say that art was like your first uh, passion? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, that's I, you know, I, my art career started out when I was like in seventh grade and I started doing murals in my local local towns here in Michigan. And I had done about uh, 21 of these murals. And then I got a scholarship to, to go to this school called Interlock and Arts Academy. And then from there, I got another scholarship to go to, um, uh, Cooper Union, and then went off to Yale. So painting was always a big thing, but as a painter, it's always kind of hard to find an audience, or it's always kind of feast or famine. You know, you'll get a couple shows going on really good, and then you won't get any sales for the next year. So through that, I just kind of diversified through my creativity and got involved with art direction, with movie productions, and um, commercial productions, and then started to just develop some small patents type of stuff. So I've kind of like batted around all of these areas. Um, I did make an attempt at doing a film called The Wedding Video, which mm -hmm. at some point you're going to need to kind of check this out because um, I assembled uh, about 10 different casts, cast members from different shows like mm -hmm. Cyrus and Rachel and Sean um, and um, well, Mike Rachel and Francisco cast. Yeah. Yeah. 
and uh, Corey from the San Francisco cast and Cyrus and there's Julie and there's Heather. And, and so a bunch of us all come back to this wedding. So the premise is like, you know, like one of those bridezilla things, you know, it's like the wedding videographer comes and he films just disaster. And everyone was really good at giving you disaster. And, and these particular people are very good at improvisational stuff. And so just insanity, very funny stuff. And then as the, the groom of this wedding, I really don't see a lot of this reality. It's like the, the, the wedding videographer is filming everything. And then at the end of the movie, he actually cuts everything and you only see like um, 30 minutes or the I only see 30 minutes. So everyone turns into somebody very different. Do we have a great soundtrack? And we released that at the turn of this, you know, like uh, right around the millennium. And it was digital because it was wedding videos. We wanted to make it feel really authentic and real. And we were up at Sundance the same year as Blair Witch. And so, and it, but it's a comedy. So, it, and people really thought it was real, just like they thought Blair Witch was real as they thought, you know, reality was all real. And um, just people laughed and laughed. And then, you know, we went around, but it was digital at the time and it wasn't film and the theaters still didn't have digital projection. Now everything is digital projection, but there was no way to really, bond. like people didn't want to invest the money to move it up to film. So Warner Brothers kind of purchased the film and then it just kind of got lost in their vault. You know, they were going to try to move it and um, it has a gay theme to it because I'm in it. So that's always exciting. And so Warner Brothers, there wasn't like a big gay market back in the time, back then. So now things have kind of changed. And the ownership has actually kind of reverted back to me because it's been 18 years. And so the contracts to own this piece of thing, they had for like 18 years. And so I've waited about a year for them to kind of go like, hey, we have this or don't have this. I was just kind of being all quiet. So now I have this and I just so many people have never seen it and it, it really holds up. It's very kind of funny. And I, I thought through that I would maybe even start a kind of a directing career. You know, I optioned a couple properties after that. One of them is this book called One Dog Man, which is this great story of, you know, a kid grows up you know, on the Indian reservations and then moves to Cleveland, Ohio, where his mom's going to write these books. And it's one of those dog kid bully adventure kind of things set in the 1940s. Anyhow, so it's just like, yeah, I just roll with the punches. Sometimes things work out, folks, and sometimes they don't. And then all of a sudden I'm back to painting or I'm back doing this or that. You know, I don't know. <laughs> so are you thinking about doing something with the wedding video and potentially putting it I out? I certainly am. I think this is so ideal for like, you know, like Paramount and everybody because they know the people, they know the market, they know, you know, what they could do. I mean, it's, you know, they're going to, and I, th the performances are just insane. Heather B is just super, super funny. So, uh, you know, I'm certainly looking to see if I can find a door over there that can open and put some people in a room just say hey look w watch it you know everything you know if you don't if no one laughs here in the first like five minutes you know then don't call me back but i dare you i dare you you cannot and it was thunderous laughs i mean i we would go from film festival to film festival and it was so funny because at the time people weren't really hip on the real world they were kind of like disgusted the idea of like now real world reality people were making independent films and they're getting into places like Sundance and so a lot of film festivals were not kind of letting our movie in because a they thought it was a wedding video because they didn't get the whole spinal tap kind of you know farcical of this whole thing and then they would write back from the, a lot of these film festivals that rejected us like we're so sorry this actually is a real film and you know and all this good stuff and would you please come back to our film festival next year? And and then places like in Australia ran it, like Sydney, Australia, and some other foreign places, and we won awards. They didn't even have real world, or they weren't even watching it. So it just was funny on its own content. So that's kind of nice. Um, so it is an absolute gem. Um, and it's so interesting because I just came to New York for um, Rachel's daughter's wedding and Rachel's daughter is kind of in it because Rachel is pregnant during this movie and now here her daughter is just getting married it, and, and her daughter asked me she's like you know what I want Norm for my white wedding present is um you know I want that movie that my mom and dad are in I said well you're in it too actually your, your mom's like eight months That's, pregnant it's you full know? certain she's, moment I know and I just said absolutely so I'm gonna certainly kind of get that out. I'll have to, I'll have to send you some teasers or, or, or definitely the trailer on it and let you know what's going on. And maybe you'll have me come back. Well, if we can figure a way, because, you know, if I, you know, it just, 
it just seems like if I just drop it onto YouTube, which I could do now, um, it would just get lost. I mean, I, you know, there's just, it's always kind of like hit or miss. You know, sometimes I put something on my Instagram and, you know, I got like several thousand people following me and, and there'll be like a thousand people have seen it. And the next day I'll put something up and there's only like nine people see something. I like, it's so hit or miss on, on uh, how to gauge an audience. But I, I, I really think that if it's put in the right place, I think the news is going to come around it. And I think people are going to be pretty satisfied um, with it. And, uh, you know, I, you know, talking about it, because I can't stop talking about it. Sorry. Um, we played at the Indiana Film Festival. Okay. And this was in India, in Indianapolis. Well, they lost their minds and they ended up doing a play. So these people literally redid a whole play in each year they would do a play of the movie. Like that's the how, wedding. I don't know these people, I don't know these people, these people literally lost their minds and they felt and so in love with it that they did a stage play and they would keep doing the stage play of this movie in this little town somewhere. I'm like, wow. what? Well, Indianapolis is kind of a big place, but we couldn't believe it. So, you know, we did come in like uh, two years afterwards and we were gobsmacked that these people were like they, the one was a wedding planner. They literally like they, they, it connected to them. So that was so funny. And, and we did play at the, the Houston world fest and we were at the rice university there and they were, they didn't expect this. Like all of a sudden the real world, you know, I was doing like gauntlet challenges about at that time. Cause it was like early two thousands and stuff. So um, I got reconnected to the audience that way. And all of a sudden the film festival was just overwhelmed. Like they had all these other films playing in their film festival. And all of a sudden they didn't expect all these people wanted to see this film. And they all thought it was like really real. Like they just like Blair Witch, like, Oh my God, Julie's working in a pizza restaurant. This has happened. And all, you know, all these things have gone on, you know? And, um, and the, still to this day, Sean plays my cousin, but people are now confused. And they're thinking Sean Duffy from the Boston cast is my cousin. And it's because this movie it's like we played with fiction and reality. And Sean's not my cousin, but he plays my cousin on this thing. <laughs> and so they had to schedule a whole other day because so many people were freaking out, like in the parking lot, they couldn't get a chance to see this movie at Rice University. So um, I, I called, that's when I called this guy at Warner Brothers and I, I just paid for his flight. I said, you, you just have to come and see this. I know that this doesn't make sense. But I'm, these people are like lining up and they're showing up at these film festivals and they, they lose their minds. Like if you just, just go inside and watch this thing, you're not going to be able to like breathe. I mean, I'm telling you, Heather B is like, she's genius in this, in this, in this, in this production. So I, and I was really hoping that someone would see the such talent that she has, you know? So anyway, it's funny. There, a lot about the wedding video. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> What would you say the contrast was for you coming off of your original stint on your show? It's like you did the real world, obviously, the very first season, and then you did a few challenges. Where would you say, like, your contrast was as far as, like, maybe your career path or, like, getting your foot in the door with um, your career? Like, were you looked at sideways because you came from reality television? Oh, gosh. You know, um, that's, like, a loaded question. And Let's go down the bummer path for a moment here, folks. Oh, it's so sad. Um, and anyhow, um, I was looked at kind of sideways, but like kind of with a pink stink. I mean, there was like there weren't very many like openly gay people. In fact, there was zero going on in like television. And so that was really hard to swallow. Was that more than anything? Like, I, you know, people would reach out to me, like the people that developed Conan O'Brien. Like I was supposed to be Conan O'Brien back in the day. Like that was going to be the new talk show dude. And so they saw, Oh, we want MTV talent. We need MTV talent. Like that's when you wanted to go to the talent pool for young and all this demographics, you ran there, you got like a poly shore, you got this person, you got that person, you went in there. So when all of a sudden here were these new kind of Bev, you know, 90210, you name it, like Melrose Placey kind of people, but in MTV, that meant like any of those people work for any talent. Like they didn't really get that we weren't actors and this, you know, whole other thing. So they call me up, you know, you know, the, the whole NBC people to like come in, 
shoot this big pilot, all these cameras every which way. And then, you know, they went ahead and started shooting everything. And then all of a sudden it was like the, the whispering was going on. It was like, because no one had watched the real world. They just knew that we were on MTV on a TV show. And that was enough for them to say, well, we need that. They didn't, gay wasn't around then. So all of a sudden when they find out like, we but we have the gay one that we're doing stuff with. And it was like, dun, 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 dun. Ah. so I was always kind of politely dismissed. So it was a good five years, seven years. In fact, it went on almost up to making this wedding video where there, you know, there wasn't really a home for me in that way. So I know a lot of other people were kind of looked at, you know, oh, reality, this, this, that. But some of the, the cast members, you know, they broke through. I mean, I'm, I, I know that it was really great to see Jacinda from the London cast start getting really credible roles. You know, she was like in that movie Backdraft and then she was like in that. Um, she got like several television series and, you know, she was with like, you know, Oscar winners and, you know, she was really credibly breaking through and, you know, and, and of course we have several other people that have been able to, 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 you know, fulfill that. So that's been really great. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the girl from the San Diego cast. Oh, you know. Jamie Chung. Jamie. Yes. Yes. Yeah. She's great. Oh my God. I love that. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Sucker Punch, but that's one of my favorite movies. She was and in Grown Zach Ups as well. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, so great. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. Tears. <laughs> but I'm around. I look good. So, there you have it. Who knows? This could be my year. So, would, did you not have, like, a good reception coming off the show? Or was it, like, a fine line, maybe happy medium? Like, some people, like, enjoyed you and maybe some didn't? or how would you say that, that it was for you? I mean, the public was always really supportive, at least the ones that like, wow, you know, you've done, you've changed something. And I think a lot, that's even more important than, I, you know, I don't know, getting some big award was actually socially helping change something, you know, and helping other people, you know, through this process, you know, that people could identify themselves with me and my cast. And then they could say, there's someone out there like me and it's in the public in a very cool setting, like an MTV setting. So that helped people all over the place and it gave them a lot of confidence. So that in a turn was really super awesome. But yeah, there definitely was, you know, um, you know, like, oh, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was kind of funny. Um, I was working on a job early on when I, um, moved to Hollywood. I was the same thing kind of came down with like working on talk soup. I was going to be on talk soup, but it, it always came down to the same answer. It's like, I don't think we can really fly with a, like a, a gay person. We're just, we're not going to have the sponsorship. They're just weren't ready. So then I said, well, I, I want to work behind the scenes anyway. So let's go. And, um, and I would be working with a group of guys and they were kind of funny because they're just kind of frat guys. I'm kind of a frat guy. And, um, and everybody would kind of staring at them because I, they were gay by association. So I'm like, but they always like hung out with me and they're really great. And they're still like my best mates, you know, they're straight and stuff. But they'd always would giggle because I was the rainbow flag. You know, I was like, everyone could know who I was in public. But if you were around me, then immediately you had to be gay too. So they would, at first they didn't know why everybody was always checking them out and stuff. <laughs> And then they would laugh about it a lot. Um, so they were like, oh, God, Norm, we're gay by association. So th that went on, you know, definitely th for, the, for the first decade or so. Mm. I would say that maybe you were like, in a way, a stepping stone for other future cast members that were gay to come forward as being gay, like on TV, because you did it, you know? Mm. Oh, absolutely. And and I, you know, and I, I, I get that uh, a lot of great accolades from some of the other cast members and uh, Danny in particular. I just did an event with him in the New Orleans season. And, um, you know, I didn't know to the extent, you know, he was much younger. He was probably like in middle school or something when I was in college, uh, when he was watching the show. And, and it really had an impact on him. And um, so and, and that was a good thing. And and. And even up with like, you know, I knew, I knew, I knew Pedro just briefly. I mean, you know, he passed away by the end of that summer. So I, I met him when the show was airing and, um, and it was just great to see 
that there was a community that could actually now hear something with, you know, that really was problematic in the community. And now that there, there was an audience to actually give a little more sympathy, you would say, and, and it really propelled, you know, San Francisco into the, the, the stratosphere. I think, you know, that became one of the highest rated um, seasons of any of the real worlds. Mm. Did you like the way you were portrayed on the show? Because I believe I saw an article that said that they uh, tried to kind of typecast you as like bisexual. Um, I didn't at the time. And I guess we want to g- get down to brass tacks. You know, uh, yes, I've slept with plenty of women. I have slept with women, you know. And so if you want to be all scientific about it, which I guess, you know, maybe that's when they did all the interviews of all that stuff. But you kind of have to interview or get to know somebody from where they're at in their life, you know. It's like are, here you are at fourth grade and here you are here and here you go through these experiences and then these experiences bring you somewhere, you know, and this is my experience. You know, I, I obviously, you know, I had um, I was in a year relationship with another man at the time. And so, so I mean, I, I so it was it was kind of frustrating for me a little bit. And I think a lot of people who who knew me like going what are you trying to do like and it's hard because there was so little representation and it's really unfair to put everything on one person like i'm not a lesbian or trans and the whole community just kind of dumping everything on me so at the same time you know i was getting uh, and, and most of the the flack that was coming in it wasn't even in the straight community was just like anything was was so great and satisfying and confirmational to hear but you know the, it was really the the trouble i was having was like the really the, the gay community because they had been suffered and so marginalized and didn't have anybody and all of a sudden this is what just showed up and they're like here it is again you know no one can actually just come out and blah blah, blah. you know i'm like i said i don't have control over the edit you know they film me i don't have control over this and so I, I, you know, I, it was, that was a, a little, a little frustrating. Um, and um, I think it really stuck with the, the early form of the gay community because they really haven't, those people that run everything and approve everything and give you an award for everything, they've really not ever, you know, looked at me other than a disaster for them. So I've not really been much of anything for them <laughs> what, what was it about you like on the show that they chalked up to be like a disaster or maybe like a misrepresentation I, exactly so i'm not you know I, I think it was just pretty much coming down to you know um that label saying bisexual it was interesting because it was julie on the sh- show that says oh you know norm didn't just come out and say bisexual i mean i'm recording and uh, you're getting everything from me but you know when they when they go to other people, you know, they, they, they use someone else to kind of, you know, define, you know, me at, at, at the time and, and what's wrong with it, you know, whatever. So even and at that point, I was like, you know, I, if, if I have to stand up for bisexuals or going to stand up for whoever, I'm, I'm going to try to do my best to do that. I'm just that kind of person. So, um, and you shouldn't even be putting people like that down on the first place or whatever. It's, you know, all this kind of stuff. But <laughs> in the early days, it was just really frustrating because there just there wasn't any 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 uh, nothing. I mean, and so it's weird. I mean, we look at Russia today and we complain about like you know the Russia doesn't want any gays. I mean, you're in trouble if you even go over there. But we were kind of like that in the '90s, so in the '80s, and so you know things had to change. And I said we're going to change them. There we go. <laughs> and and now it's like kind of wild that when the real world started that was essentially like the birth of reality tv i would say in a sense and mm-hmm. you're obviously coming forth as like the first gay person nowadays like with the reality genre anybody that just come forward as gay is just run of the mill at this point like it's just the norm <laughs> yeah it's the norm yeah no pun intended right i didn't even <laughs> Yeah, it's the norm. Um, it's like that with like every movie or TV show. I wait for that shoe to drop. I'm, you know, I love Stranger Things. You watch that Stranger Things show? Yep, yep. Of course. Now there's like a lesbian relationship going on in there. It's just like, oh, you know, I if you're up, I'm sorry, spoiler alert. If you're not up to season four or whatever, or even to season three, but you know, the 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 gal that works in the the video stuff and 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 the the ice cream shop and the pretzel place, you know, she's you know, they got. 
I mean, they wouldn't even touch a subject like that in 1980 on anything, you know. Now, all of a sudden, we've kind of re-added this in there, which is nice. I mean, it's it's good to see, and it's good for all the kids to see that there's a place and, uh, uh, you know, a voice. I mean, I don't know. We've, we've been the punching bags for so long. Yeah. Well, I've been saying, actually, like, for quite some time now that, like, it doesn't feel like reality, the genre is quite where it once was anymore and that's like bound to happen as far as like with the shift due to like the times we're currently in like it's a very social media heavy thing mm -hmm. so where like things start to become less authentic and like the genre just shifts but i will say though with coming out of the three homecomings that we've had so far those mm -hmm. somehow seem to exceed like the notion currently of like reality not being what it once was because i felt like those homecomings took us back to those roots of like just people sitting around a living room and having conversations did, did you right. like how did you maybe feel about the homecomings as a whole thus far like did you enjoy them as a viewer and then obviously you were in one of them so there's going to be a little bit of a vested interest there but what what is like your feelings on them thus far absolutely i mean um I you know, I, the unique thing about the real world as very different than the other reality shows that are out there, and which is the most interesting, smallest thing is that the cast members are driving the narrative of the stories, rather than, you know, you've got Big Brother, which has got a big carrot dangling, and then you get reality aspects around it, you know, and so it really came back to those formative roots of the show and people underestimate that it's so refreshing to see an organic storyline you know that you know like you got the housewives you already know that everything is dolled up you know you already know that these people got a lot you know you don't get like schnooky showing up at like you know the housewives you know you don't get you know you already get you know what you're going to get there it's already kind of pre-controlled everything most reality shows no matter how they are they're already controlled even the bachelorettes and all that kind of crap i mean all of these things are yeah they're providing new stuff and new storylines and la da 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 but with the show and coming back with the homecoming which i was really satisfied with was that ability to once again drive the narrative of the show so you know you really it's interesting to see how our lives have changed and grown or where they've gone over in our case 30 years and in some of the other cases you know over 20 years and you know people have families and kids and they have different ideas of who they were and where they want to go you know and that kind of television viewing and watching is is pretty rewarding when it's not being you know when it's actually being driven by you know like the people are driving the event rather than here's some producers and now we're going to go in there and get crazy i mean they really kind of backed off even further and and and, and allowed us to kind of interact because they knew like this is going to be interesting it's interesting to see how people's attitudes have changed over the years you know, how people are coming to solve a problem over the years. And then these friendships that, you know, people have endured and connected with for a very long time. And so all of that really came together. The interesting thing is I, I, I they always were nervous about putting us back in because there's that idea like, oh, if they know cameras around, things aren't going to be real and, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, there's always, they're always trying to sell you, like, how real could it be if there's cameras around? But you have a life, and yes, I know about the cameras, and I know about these people, and you kind of just, we're, we know this so well that we kind of just move into it, you know, we just, we're able to move into our storylines, we could kind of anticipate the worst and the best of editing, like, I could go to this knowing, I'm going to say everything that I always say, they're going to like it or not like it, surprisingly, they kept a lot of it, and they kept a lot of the criticism to themselves, you know, and I thought that, that was like a big boy part of the production for the, you know, the producers to come on and for me to kind of question, you know, some of these things that I felt like, you know, I was misrepresented or you didn't have enough time and have them kind of like explain to the public themselves, you know, like we only had 22 minutes or we, you know, Eric Neese was just too hot. We don't really care about you. Whatever it was, they were able to come back, you know, and bring that to you. But 
um, regardless, it was still, you know, coming back with all of those people, it was super fascinating to watch. I mean, I, I, I thought I, I couldn't even watch the LA season. I, it just really, when it aired, I, I was just too personal to the show. I didn't know what had happened. You know, the whole gay thing was like, we don't gaze around anyway. So blah, 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 you know, they went off. So it was, it was hard for the LA season for me to come and I didn't get to it. And I kind of watched it and I just was like, God, they're just fighting and they're ripping apart each other. But I had to say that when I saw the homecoming and, you know, and people were able to open up about some of their issues and their problems and even to see, you know, Beth on her journey, just try to like, you know, now she's, she's a mother, she's got kids. She really wanted to have a relationship with Tammy or try to figure things out. It was interesting for me to kind of see that, you know, and, um, and it's interesting to see, you know, you had John on here and his kind of journey of like how he sees the world. It's great to have somebody with such a very different viewpoint to be able to be put in a house or with people with different viewpoints. And I think the show really accelerates to all of that. And I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I, a lot of people in the public want to kind of tear the show down or rip it apart or do whatever, or kind of underlook, you know, it, it, it is, but we really have contributed to a really, you know, to something here. I don't know what. <laughs> uh, my, my thing is like, although like there is a camera element to what you guys are doing specifically on the real world, at the end of the day, you all are rooted in just being normal people that came up from just just an ordinary upbringing. Like you, the cameras, the like social media stuff, the brands, like those didn't exist when you guys were through your casting processes to get onto New York originally. Whereas like now with reality TV, you have like the Housewives, the Kardashians, like all those shows. Like, why aren't these same shows being argued like, oh, they know the cameras are there when in my eyes, there's very evidently a brand thing going on there. Whereas like you guys, you guys don't really necessarily care about a brand as much as it, you guys are focused on just having conversations. So I don't know where the whole real world homecoming hate comes from, but yeah, <laughs> I'm not. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're clever though. Those people, I, you know, they certainly figured, they figured it all out. I mean, you know, these, the people that the Osbournes and the Kardashians and those who kind of walked in our footsteps, kind of, they, they noticed like the, geez, this is incredible. You know, we can spotlight all of our branding and we have a network behind us, you know, <laughs> kind of, kind of going down. So, um, and they keep things just kind of very like in that box, you know, you, even Jersey Shore, it's all right in that box. You're not, you're not throwing in an Eskimo in there or throwing in some other kind of like wild card that's going to stir that whole thing up. You know, they're pretty much like lockstep right into it, you know. So yeah. they're, they're definitely taking care of their own and then they're able to build an empire on it, you know. So and and that's 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 how it is. But I think when it comes back to the the success of the real world and how when, when I've talked to my sisters and other friends, just how it affected their generation by seeing people who are from just these, just, you know, ordinary kind of backgrounds for the most part, you know, we, we don't have like super celebrities and all that kind of stuff in our backgrounds and all the rest of that kind of stuff. But um, for the most part, you know, trying to navigate in this like, America, modern kind of world kind of thing going on. And, um, and, and so that's kind of, it's kind of interesting, I suppose. Yeah. Would you like to see like a uh, fourth homecoming season? Like, is that something you would tune into? I mean, I, I honestly, I literally, I mean, these people's lives, they've been around. I mean, regardless, we have been branded. I mean, you know, I have been on television now 30 years and, a lot of people have connected to a lot of the different cast people and um, and some of them have real, real interesting stories. I mean, I don't, I, I find them, I, I found New Orleans, it, you know, really interesting. I found them all both interesting, much more interesting than when I, I saw their, the show, you know, I don't know, maybe because I'm of that age and it's interesting for me to see, you know, people who have kids and how to navigate you know, big social issues, not only within the cast, but also how that relates to their kids and things like this, you know, or them, 
just trying to find themselves still, you know, people that, you know, the, um, his name's Tokyo now, but, you know, he's gone through evolutions in his life is trying to find an identity that's like connecting to him. And, you know, and, and it was real interesting for me to watch, like when he did do that little song business, you know, come be, you know, Melissa couldn't help, but jump on it, become be my baby tonight. And this is the big moment and all that stuff, you know, just, how serious this was for this man and his creativity. And yet then all of these bigger Hollywood components looking at it, maybe in not such um, the best light kind of making a little fun of it, you know, and I don't think he kind of picked up on it. And then how did that impacted him? And so it's interesting to see a lot of this stuff. You know, I found, I found it very interesting and, 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 and it's very generous of these people to bring their themselves to this, to, as a learning experience you know uh, i don't know i'm holding out hope that miami gets one next but i know i did hear some my 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 buddy mike who's in the wedding video oh, i'm having him on awesome. tomorrow actually oh good we'll grill him about the wedding video he is funny we <laughs> live together in this castle and rachel so we're we're quite tight and um so he's he's funny he is he is a comedy non-stop comedy and he is just funny in this wedding video. So I, I'd love it. And, and last time I had heard from him, I thought maybe they were reaching out to him to do this. Um, you know, you got Big Gay Dan. I, I get to call him Big Gay Dan because that's my Big Gay Dan. And he is insane and funny. And, and he does some really kind of really good. St I mean, he's out there. He's a nurse. He's in the middle of this COVID. I, it's not what I think he signed up for. But his stories are funny. And he's got a lot to say. And, you know um <laughs> they've got a fun cast that miami cast <laughs> from what i know they're all on board for it so we'll have to see what the future holds yeah i don't know i mean i don't know i think it's hard because um you know it's i i know paramount's trying to do one thing and they're trying to get subscribers but you know we're, in, we're the, the economy sucks sorry it's just awful and <laughs> So it's just real hard right now for a lot of people to come up a lot of different, you know, HBO and then Paramount and then this and that, all these things. I think had it just went out to like CBS, MTV. MTV or something like this, I don't know. I think maybe this would be uh, maybe a different, different, you know, maybe a different beast in here. Um, so I, I, but then MTV is just like, oh God, these people are all 50. These kids are like, you know, <laughs> People watching them, I don't mean anything to them. It's like it'd be like me watching, you know, I don't know, Ricky Nelson or someone from the fifties, the nineteen fifties. You know, like you know, it's like it wouldn't make any sense to me. Like I totally get it. So the, maybe the demographics, but I don't know. VH one's pretty hip or something, or with an age demographic. I don't know. I don't know. But I, again, I think if there was like a hypothetical, like every was it i think it was wednesday right if there was like an every wednesday like designated time like weekly thing right i think you would see like a spike in the ratings like if you just said every wednesday eight o'clock eastern on mtv like the network i think you would see a spike but because like you know all this new streaming services everybody's getting pulled in like 50 different directions so now like that probably plays a part it does Absolutely. And I, and, and I, you know, these networks, you, you kind of feel for them because they're all, there's always a new network going on. I mean, I, I got this Roku TV thing oh, and all of a sudden there's all these Roku channels and all these other crazy crackle and smackle and all these things. I mean, every time I turn around, there's like, in, in all fairness, I have a Roku as well and I quite enjoy it. So uh, in all fairness, but no, I don't, I don't put poo poo anything down. I'm just, I just see the landscape of competition, you know, and how, difficult it is and it's it's nice that you've been able to uh, spotlight and uh, bring some attention to you know our little shows here and have yeah. some of the the cast members come and spill their goods did you like your time on the challenges because i had a great time on the challenges and i was pretty like um fit at the time so you didn't really want to mess around with me and they were just before this the, the whole new class of the cjs and the johnny bananas and the rest of that stuff when people that's all they do is just like eat train and get on a challenge and and you know they all get paid anyway whether they win or not so it's that job is still better than working you know whatever they would be doing you know and that wouldn't be much so they literally all came in but 
that one, the last gauntlet that I did changed. The Miz came on that with me. That's when he decided he was going to be called the Miz. And it got hardcore and everyone was getting injured. Like the level of what we were doing, you know, flying planes and jumping out of helicopters and rough rugby on top of a mountain in like rocks and stone and mud. I mean, like I, I don't know, I got like eight, 30 stitches in my knee and rappelling down mountains and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, it got like crazy at that point. And then after that, it just went into gauntlet fever and the rest of that kind of stuff, you know, and then they just, they have their, their people that they have and they just kind of recycle the same people. It seems, you know, it's like the same guy. It's like, Oh, it's the all-star, all-star, all-star. It's the all-star of all the all-stars, you know, I'm like, but it's the same people. And then everyone's so jacked up on steroids or something. I don't even like, I can barely <laughs> recognize them from who they used to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, you almost won the gauntlet. Uh, you know, I know. The, the I know. coral spider bite is a big thing in oh. question. I, I need to know like your thoughts because Nathan was on your team and he seemed to believe that it was a little milked. Do you think that the spider bite actually occurred? We had, you know, everything was definitely in our past. And, you know, it just didn't seem right a little bit to go into it with all guys, like wiping out all the girls, you know, and, um, and there was a question like, you know, um, you know, here we're going to, we can, I mean, we, we literally that Sarah had like that little Sarah on the other team, you know, getting everybody out of the yeah. gauntlet. She was like our, our winning, but she was like, she was a workhorse. You're doing our, our work for us. Getting everyone out. <laughs> We love her. I love Sarah to this day. And, um, but yeah, I mean, when it really came down to it and there was that decision and I don't know, the vote kind of came, I, I unfortunately came down to the Miz, honestly, and they were both on the same cast, but I made a strong argument. Like, we don't know what, we don't know what we're going to do, like literally as the last challenge and you don't know what you're going to do, but what if it was something that was really needed to have a woman to solve the problem, you know, like, you know, and it was kind of like good optics and stuff, but all of us were certainly the, the other physical choice um, uh, that was proposed to us, um, w w which was another guy. And, um, I, you know, I think he um, would have physically been able to handle. I mean, it was no joke. We had to run a marathon up a 10,000 foot mountain that day. And so we were already at altitude craziness. What was the whole problem with this gauntlet thing was that. We would go to this mud ball, grease and grab a ball. Well, it looked like mud, but it was on top of a shale mountain. So everything was like jagged, rocky mountain slicers. So I got 30 stitches. Everybody else, we ran in and blood everywhere. The people weren't testing the shit. That's what I was saying with this gauntlet. They literally kept going more aggro. So when we went to go, we already went into two things that busted, like hardcore where people were injured. Trishel was mangled. And so... We like literally were going into this last thing and there was literally no just delays, delays, camera delays and nowhere for like, I mean, guys just go piss, you know, out in the woods, but like nowhere private yeah. for, you know, and so she went back into these like bushes, you know, and like literally, you know, was went to go take a leak and, and literally got bit and like, was it bit by a, a, a spy, you know, that she got bit by something. I mean, and then race us up like a 10,000 foot mountain with puzzles. And it sucked because, you know, the, the unfortunate thing was, is like, no matter what we did, because she was airlifted away and when it, it, we were, the rules were, we couldn't win. You had to have all of us or none of us could win. So we just sat there picking our nose during the whole thing waiting for that team of 13 people which sucked for them because they had to buy all those fuckers a car because they yeah. that was real yeah <laughs> i'm like you're gonna let five people win and only five fucking cars are gonna be here or you're gonna let 13 people win but no they were like no so technically i feel like i won anyway i mean we got the money in our bank account whatever we accrued and split that all up but um but yeah, I know the the guys were disappointed, and, and then when she couldn't make it across, it was I mean we were like carrying her for a while on our shoulders and stuff like that. You know, we each were running up this mountain, and we were still like an hour ahead of them. <laughs> oh boy.
the Battle of the Seasons one was a good one, too. Remember that with the Hurricanes? Yeah. That was like right after 9-11, too. That was right after 9-11. And, and you know, both um, Coral, Coral, and there was another girl that was coming in. They were on the flight that crashed into, they had the tickets. They were on their flight to crash into the World Trade Center out of Boston. They were up in Bo- Coral. And I, that's when I first had met Coral because Miz and Coral were just coming off their season. And um, Coral, who was who was on that flight? Two of them were doing a lecture in Boston, and they were on that United flight. And to come, you know, and then all of a sudden everything went bananas, and um, something happened, and they couldn't get on the flight. You know, something happened. They were supposed to be on that flight. Um to come to the West Coast or whatever, I think it came and slammed into the the World Trade Center. But it was they were on that United flight leaving um, Boston, and, and both of them didn't make it because of this whole show was going down and everything. So uh, they would have been on that flight, which would have been we'd we'd be still talking about that today. <laughs> you know, like oh, uh. that that was also the birth of yours and Beth's little uh, <laughs> fiasco. Uh, yes, our 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 many. To tats, which is very, very fun. I got to, I got to brand her as Osama Bin Laden. <laughs> this will be a, a final question, just for the masses, so they know. Were you contacted to do any of the challenge All Star seasons? I was to do what when we were doing the homecoming. Uh, I was um, Mark Long and Coral and I were supposed to be on the same team, and um, the COVID thing with Eric and everything shoved us backwards, and they had to start shooting. So. Um, I was supposed to come like OG thing that I was yeah. supposed to, yeah. So I, I was supposed to be on that one, and and uh, and, and, Cor- and so we were back and forth and on all that. So it's mm-hmm. gonna be you and Coral like on a team together. Yeah, so Coral and I were go- on on the team because she was trying to get me to stay on it, and I said, oh, I'm doing this homecoming thing, but I can't really. I, we weren't even allowed to tell any of the cast that we were doing this, the homecoming. Like nobody was supposed to know. They had us all, you know, the cats out of the bag now. But at that point, we were, like, signed. Like, they didn't want any of the cats to know that anything was like this was happening or anybody. Like, they were really going to, you know, I don't know. I think they had bigger aspects. I mean, when they launched that Homecoming show, I mean, we were on bus posters and billboards. Like, I'd never seen the real world go out that way. But Paramount was launching for the first time. Like, and so they were trying to do everything hush-hush. They didn't want any of the cast to know. They didn't want anyone to know. They really wanted it to be like this is happening this week, you know. And they were going to do a big commercial on the um, the Super Bowl and announce that year um, the launch of Paramount Plus. So, but yeah, um, so it was in the background to to go. So Mark had been he'd been on me all summer long. That whole you know they couldn't get it all together, couldn't get it all together. So it was constantly rotating, but. Mm-hmm. You think you'll potentially be open to it if there's any more? I don't know. I told him, I was like laughing, is that, you know, once you guys, you know, you need to do some other stuff on there. You know, you need to have some cooking competitions, some design t- competitions. You know, like who g- give a house here? Who's going to do the best job of designing the house? Like I'm 55, you know, I need some like age appropriate challenges, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I need some DIY challenges. <laughs> well, uh, it was great catching up with you, though. Yeah. Hey, it's good catching up with you. I'm so excited you're going to talk to uh, Mr. Uh, Lambert tomorrow. Know? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I'll let you know when this is out. I'll tag you and all that fun stuff. Okay. And um, have a great rest of your day. All right. Bye. <laughs>